All right, so we are ready to start. One second. Um, so hello everyone and welcome to the new series of the Electrochemical Colloquium. Uh, as always, we will be hosting experts in theory, experiments, calculations across many different fields. And so for those of you who are new to our colloquiums, we here don't put an emphasis on electrochemistry itself. The talks typically address a lot of different topics that are relevant to the physical chemistry, electrochemistry, material science, and characterization. So the topics, these topics are sort of supposed to open new avenues in the field of electrochemistry, hopefully sometime in the future, or at least give you an idea of what are the state of the arts in this field. So today we're discussing the density of functional theory, and um, we hope to bring it closer to the reality when we're gonna go over the different aspects of this. Uh, today we're hosting Professor John Perdue, who is among the best experts in DFT and first principle methods. And we all know that the impact of science that uh, John Perdue has made, so perhaps this is best put by the National Academy of Sciences, which is that uh, John Perdue pioneered a sound mathematical and physical foundation under the concept ideas of DFT. So John, thank you so much for joining us today and offering this excellent opportunity to learn from you and to hear you. So now the stage is yours. Thank you, Andrew. Uh... And thanks to everybody for, uh, for attending. Uh, my talk is gonna be uh, about density functional theory, which is a subject that I've been working on for about 50 years now. I got interested in it 50 years ago and I've been interested in it ever since. I'm still very interested. Uh, uh, the talk is in two parts. Uh, the first part is, is about the basics of density functional theory. Uh, that will be roughly 40 minutes, I guess. And at the end of that, there'll be an op uh, a short opportunity for questions about the basics. And then I have also have a research talk, which will be about 50 minutes. Uh, and at the end of that, again, there'll be an opportunity for questions. So let me try to share my screen. You see that? Yes. Good, okay. So let me... Good, okay. So uh, this, this, this is the, about the basics of density functional theory or DFT. Uh, and uh, let me be, oh, I, I guess I ought to, uh, make it go into the slideshow. I think that's better. <clears throat> now let's see if I can move forward. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, so the, the first question I wanna address is what is density functional theory? Uh, so DFT is a computationally efficient and usefully accurate way to address the ground state, ground state electronic structure problem for atoms, molecules, and solids. Uh, and it does that by avoiding correlated wave functions. It replaces it, the role of the correlated wave function in, in wave function theory is replaced by the density and density functional theory. Or... Um, and the uh, uh, density functional theory is, uh, uh, answers questions such as the following. For instance, what atoms, molecules, and solids can exist and with what properties? What are the ground state energies E, the uh, ground state energy difference is delta E, and the electron densities N of R or the electron spin densities N up of R and N down of R. Uh, what are the vibration frequencies of the nuclei? Um, how much energy is needed to remove electrons from a system or to break the bonds? So these are questions. Uh, uh, 
it's it's only uh, it's only uh, uh, the ground state that is described exactly in principle in density functional theory, but but the excited states ca can also be calculated and they have some some significance, so they're usually less accurate than the ground states. Uh, so uh, overall, there are two first principles approaches for uh, for materials prediction prediction of what materials can exist and with what properties. Uh, the first one, uh, which follows most directly from quantum mechanics, is the correlated wave function theory. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this approach uh, gets the right answer for the right reason. Uh, but it can be a, uh, it can come that answer can come at a great computational cost, uh, especially for larger uh, systems, systems of many, very many electrons. Uh, and uh, the other approach is the density functional theory, which is rooted in the correlated wave function theory, as as I'll discuss in this talk. Uh, this theory uh, prom promises almost the right answer for almost the right reason at almost the right price for almost all systems of interest, including systems of uh, many electrons. Uh, the almost are there because there, there are un, uh, un, uh, there's a, an unavoidable requirement for approximation, uh, approximation to an underlying exact theory. Uh, so this this tutorial will present the uh, logical and mathematical structure of the correlated wave function and density functional theories. I'll go through them both. Uh, it'll explain why both theories are needed. Uh, and in fact, uh, it will show you that density functional theory is rooted in the correlation wave function theory. Uh, and uh, uh, correlated wave function theory provides uh, accurate benchmarks to test density functionals. That's one, one of the important roles that it has within density functional theory is that for small systems, it can give us very accurate answers, uh, which can be used to test the approximations. Uh, and after this talk, I'll have a separate research talk, which will explain how density functional approximations are developed in some detail. I'll, I'll put special focus on the... Uh, highly predictive SCAN functional. SCAN is uh, an acronym for strongly constrained and appropriately normed, and I'll explain what that means. Uh, uh, the, that second talk will also present the physical applications uh, of, of the density functionals, including SCAN, uh, with a focus on symmetry breaking and how symmetry breaking can describe strong correlations in density functional theory. So just 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 as a check, everybody is hearing me and seeing the slides. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Okay. So uh, let me begin with uh, uh, this question: How widely used is density functional theory? And and it's remarkable how widely it's used. Uh, for instance, uh, if you if your library has a subscription to the Web of Science, and it probably does. Uh, you can uh, do a topic search on the web of science. You can, you can uh, designate a topic like quantum mechanics, and you can see how many times that topic has been cited in a given time period. So I'm going to focus on the past 50 years. Uh, in that time, uh, the topic quantum mechanics has been mentioned 56,000 times. Now, of course, quantum mechanics is used in nearly all, all of the uh, uh, theoretical uh, physics and chemistry now, and so it's implicitly used in many more, uh, many more, uh, many more time, many more papers than that. But fifty-six thousand papers explicitly mention the words quantum mechanics. Uh, uh, the words quantum theory were mentioned more often, one hundred and seventy in one hundred and seventy-seven thousand articles. But the word density functional was mentioned in three hundred and fifty-one thousand articles. Uh, and that's, that's, of course, because the density functional theory is so widely used. Uh, and when it's used, it, ha it has to be identified as the theory that you're using. So, so it, it gets a lot of mentions. 
There was a, 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 an article in, in the, the journal Nature in 2014, which uh, studied the 100 most cited scholarly uh, papers since 1900. And of those uh, 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 most cited papers, 11 were density functional papers. And in the top 10 uh, cited papers, two were density functional papers. So there's a, uh, a lot of use for density functional theory. And uh, why is that? Why is it so widely used? Well, to understand that, you have to understand why uh, correlated wave functions are are impractical for large systems, at least at the current level of, of implementation. Uh, <clears throat> let's, uh, 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 so, let, so let me go through correlated wave function theory first, and then I'll, and then I'll tell you about why, why it's difficult to implement for systems of many electrons. So uh, uh, the idea of functional underlies both theories, and a functional is a rule that assigns a number, for instance, lowercase h, to every function, for instance, the uppercase psi. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, functional that occurs most naturally in, in the correlated wave function theory uh, is h of psi. So psi is a many electron wave function, a wave function for capital N electrons, where capital N is an integer, could be large. Uh, and uh, the functional h of psi is the expectation value of h in the state psi, which is just an integral, of course. Uh, and so to every, uh, so if you know the Hamiltonian, which is fixed, and you know a, a set of wave functions, then to every wave function, you can assign uh, a, 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 a number h of psi. And that the rule that, that does that is the, uh, it, it defines the functional. Uh, now, <laughs> There's a wave function variational principle which implies the Schrodinger equation uh, and, and is interesting and valuable in its own right. Uh, it says that the, uh, the extrema, the minima, the maxima, or the saddle points of this functional H of psi, these are, these are, these are, point, these are points in wave function space, the space of possible wave functions for N electrons, uh, these are the uh, these are the stationary states. The extrema are the stationary states. The uh, ground state is a, is the absolute minimum, and higher excited states are uh, other kinds of extrema, uh, which could also be local minima. And the uh, the absolute minimum is the ground state uh, that fun that uh, that uh, functional h of psi is the ground state energy, and the wave function that delivers it is the ground state wave function. Uh, the energy E, it turns out to be the Lagrange multiplier for the normalization of the wave function in this wave function variational principle. So, uh, so correlated wave functions can be accurate, but they're never used for very large electron numbers because the computational cost is prohibitive. Uh, and uh, a uh, sort of qualitative argument for that was given in Walter Cohn's Nobel Lecture. So Walter Cohn uh, uh, creates, and uh, he won the Nobel Prize in, in chemistry in 1998 for the development of this theory, which, which in the 1990s was becoming very popular in chemistry. So Cohn said, uh, Imagine that you're doing all your calculations on a grid. That may not be the way you actually do your calculations. You may use a basis set, like a, 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 a set of analytic functions as a basis. And that may make things go a little faster or substantially faster, but there's still a problem, which, which, is, which you can see most clearly if you, if you think in terms of grid points. So imagine a, a, a grid in the three-dimensional position space with capital M points. Uh, uh, and this grid has to be defined for each of the n, n electron positions in the correlated wave function, because the correlated wave function is a function of the position, position vector for electron one, position vector for electron two, up through the position vector for electron n, where n is the number of electrons. Then we have to compute and store 
uh, m to the power n values of the wave function uh, because there are m, m grid points for R1, m for R2, and so on. Uh, now, if you think about m to the n, it grows very rapidly with n. So uh, let's, let's just uh, take, fix the number of grid points at 1,000. That's not really enough, but it illustrates the point. Uh, if uh, we have a two electron system, uh, m to the n is 10 to the three to the two, which is 10 to the six. 10 to the six numbers is no problem for a computer to handle. Uh, if you have uh, 10 electrons already, uh, 10 to the three to the 10 is 10 to the 30, and that's not practical for, for computers. Uh, if you avoid grids, uh, then you can study, uh, but at great expense, up to 100 uh, electrons with many elect electron theory. <clears throat> uh, the advantage of using the density, if you could do it, would be uh, that, the, the, that the density would only require uh, computing and storing m equals 10 to the three values in this example, because the density is only, uh, the electron density is a function of only one vector in three-dimensional space and not n. So, uh, so what has uh, density functional theory accomplished in 50 years? Uh, well, density functional theory has achieved a remarkable predictive accuracy for the ground state properties of nearly all SP bonded uh, uh, and, uh, uh, molecules and solids. And some DNF, some DNF bonded molecules and solids are also well described by the best density functionals. Um, so this density functional theory is now foundational for much of chemistry, including the electrochemistry. Uh, it's foundational for condensed matter physics, including the low dimensional and topological materials, for materials science, for geophysics, and, and many other fields. Uh, what are the challenges that remain for density functional theory? There are still challenges and they're difficult challenges, but I think they will be solved. Uh, the, uh, for instance, can we remove the, uh, the residue of self-interaction error from a density functional approximation? The density functional approximations, curiously, most of them are not exact in the limit of a one electron system where, you know, which is the simplest, <laughs> the simplest possible system. They're st they're, they are still only approximate and not exact even for one electron systems. Can we make them exact for all one electron densities? Uh, and doing that, uh, can we do that without sacrificing accuracy for the equilibrium properties? It's actually, it's actually not so hard to make them exact for all one electron densities. But typically when you do that, you sacrifice the accuracy that the functional has for many electron densities. Can we avoid that uh, trade-off? Um, uh, and then beyond that, will the self-interaction correction plus symmetry breaking, which I'll talk about in my research talk, make density functional theory even more widely accurate, not just for SP bonded systems, but for D or F bonded systems uh, and for uh, uh, all strongly correlated or for many strongly correlated systems. Uh, maybe all is too strong a statement. So those are the questions I want to address in both talks. Um, so let's uh, let's now uh, let, let me now take you through the the foundations of density functional theory. The logical foundations of the theory uh, were originally presented in the in the Hohenberg Cohen Sham works of, in the 1960s. But uh, in the late 1970s, uh, the, the derivations were improved by Mel Levy, who made them not only simpler, but more general. And so I'll give you the Levy constrained search approach to density functional theory. Uh, the first hohenberg cohn theorem says that there exists a functional of the density, capital F of N. So N of R is the electron density at, at, at position R in space the number of electrons per unit volume uh, as a function of position. Uh, capital F is a functional of the density, uh, the electron density. Uh, 
And the Hohenberg Hohen uh, theorem one says there exists a functional of the density such that the ground state energy and density for n electrons in the presence of an external potential V of R, which is usually the, the Coulomb attraction of the electrons to the nuclei, uh, is, uh, uh, is equal to uh, uh, the minimum over all, all n electron densities of a universal function of n, f of n, which only depends on the density and not on anything else, and another term which represents the interaction between the density and the external potential. And that, that, that term is known exactly and explicitly, and you see it here. It's the integral of V times N. So the minimum is taken over all positive densi densities uh, that integrate to N. And uh, uh, the F of N part doesn't depend on V of R. It, it's universal in the sense that it's the same functional for all external potentials. So this is, this is the density functional analog of the wave function variational principle, but now we're, we're using, the, we're searching over densities and it's, uh, it's exact. Uh, and I'll show you the proof in a minute. And uh, if, uh, there, if you accept this, then the remaining problem is to find this universal functional F of N or in practice to construct a good approximation for it. So here's the proof of the Hohenberg Cohn theorem one. This is the Levy constrained search proof. It's very simple because it starts with the wave function variational principle that I gave you before. The Hamiltonian is the sum of a kinetic energy operator T, an electron electron Coulomb repulsion V, and the interaction of each electron with the external potential V of R. And we know the Hamiltonian exactly. We have no doubt about what the Hamiltonian is. So we compute the expectation value of that wave function using an n electron wave function, and we minimize over all n electron wave functions, and that result is the ground state energy. And, and Levy's uh, very clever idea was simply to do this, this uh, search over wave functions in two steps. First, we uh, first we search over all wave functions that yield a given density. And we minimize uh, over that class of wave functions. And then in the second step, we minimize over all possible n electron densities. And that leads us immediately to the uh, Hohenberg Cohen density functional variational principle. And we have an exact expression for this universal function f of n. It's just the search, uh, the minimum uh, that results from a search over all uh, capital N electron wave functions yielding a given density uh, of the expectation value of the kinetic energy operator <clears throat> plus the electron, the electron Coulomb repulsion. <clears throat> and the wave function that yields that minimum, uh, we'll call it psi n because it depends on the density. That is the ground state uh, wave function for, for a system of ground state density N of R. Uh, the second Hohenberg Cohn theorem says that the external potential V of R, and hence the, the whole Hamiltonian, because we also know the number of electrons. If we integrate the density, uh, we get the number of electrons. So the external potential and the Hamiltonian H are determined to with an additive constant by the ground state electron density N of R. Uh, and it's easy to see that too, uh, because we start with the, what the uh, density variational principle and we find the Euler equation for the minimization of the uh, uh, density functional for the energy subject to the constraint that the number of electrons integral d3r of n is fixed at, 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 at a given uh, electron number. And, and mu is introduced here as a Lagrange multiplier for that constraint on electron number. The Euler equation then says that the functional derivative of f with respect to n of r plus the external potential minus the chemical potential equals zero. And uh, if you rearrange that equation, you find immediately that the external potential is mu minus df dn of r. Uh, mu is just a, a constant because Lagrange multipliers are constants. 
And Df dn of r is a functional of the ground state density. So this tells you immediately that the external potential is determined by uh, to within additive constant by the ground state density, exact in principle. Uh, functional derivatives play an important role in density functional theory. And they're defined uh, in, the, in the third equation from the bottom. Uh, if we make a, uh, if we have a functional f of n and we make an infinitesimal variation uh, of the density, which I'll call delta n of r, then there'll be an infinitesimal variation in the functional f. And the functional derivative is defined to be the, uh, the coefficient uh, of delta n in the linear response to, uh, 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 of the functional to a change in the density. Uh, sometimes the functional derivative is, is easy to find. I'll give you an example where it's easy, but sometimes it can be very difficult as well, depending on the functional. But it always exists uh, uh, as far as I know. So, so the simple example I'm going to give you is a local density approximation for exchange. This has the form of a uh, negative constant times the integral of the density to the four thirds over three dimensional space. And now if I make an infinitesimal variation in N, uh, the local density exchange energy will change by an amount proportional to delta N, which you see in the last equation, in the last line of this slide. And, and by looking at that, you can identify the functional derivative. So the, the functional derivative of the LDA exchange energy is minus four thirds times the constant times n to the n to the one third of R. That is going to take play the role of a local exchange potential in the um, in the theory. Uh, caution, the, the Levy constrained search is for understanding, it's not for calculating. And that's because if you actually tried to implement the Levy constrained search, uh, it would be even harder, e even more work than, than, than solving the uh, um, n electron Schrodinger equation, because you would actually have to do the search over all wave functions, which you don't want to do. Uh, <clears throat> So, uh, so in practice, to make density functional theory work, we have to approximate the, the functional f of n. And um, the known approximations for f of n, there are, there are approximations. For instance, there are local density approximations, there are gradient expansion approximations, and other approximations. Uh, they 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 have uh, they exist and they have some uh, some usefulness, but they're typically not accurate enough for the kind of problems that we want to solve in chemistry or, or physics. So, if we had to simply uh, approximate f of n using it as an explicit functional of the density, we would never achieve the level of accuracy that we need in in chemistry and physics. Uh, that problem was solved by uh, Cohn and Sham, uh, Walter Cohn and Lou Sham in 1964. Uh, they introduced spin orbitals or one electron wave functions into the theory. Uh, and uh, in their approach, their approach calculates the density n and the biggest part of f of n correctly or exactly from the orbitals. And it only approximates a much smaller part, the exchange correlation energy, the true many body part, uh, which is still important because it's nature's glue. It's what binds one atom to another to make a molecule or solid. So I don't want to say that this exchange correlation energy is unimportant. It's critically important, but it's still a small part of the total energy in, 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 in many systems. Uh, okay, so so the way they did that, the way Cohn and Sham did this was they introduced a, a Cohn-Sham non-interacting system, a system in which the electron-electron repulsion is replaced by zero. Uh, and they, they, they looked at a fictional non-interacting ground state, uh, phi n. So, so instead of upper instead of uppercase uh, psi n, which is the correlated wave function for density ground state density n of r, they introduced a, a, a an uppercase phi of sub n, which is the uh, 
not interacting wave function for the same density, usually a single Slater determinant of orbitals. Uh, it's defined to have the same density N of R and the same chemical potential as the physically correlated ground state, uh, capital Psi N. Uh, then the, um, the, the Hamiltonian for that non-interacting system uh, has no VEE, but it has, it has, it has the, the same kinetic energy as, uh, as for interacting electrons. And it has an effective potential Vs of R, which is different from the external potential. Uh, and we, we need to solve the non-interacting problem for the effective potential Vs of R. S here is, uh, stands for single particle, but it's, 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 this is not a one electron system. This is a many electron system, uh, but the electrons are non-interacting. Uh, so phi n uh, by the Levy constraint search is that non-interacting wave function that yields the density n of R and minimizes the expectation value of the kinetic energy. So, so now we can, uh, we can write out explicitly uh, expressions for all the terms in the energy, formally exact expressions for all the terms in the energy using, uh, using the correlated and uncorrelated uh, ground state wave functions, not interacting and interacting ground state wave functions. So first of all, the, the Hohenberg cone F of N, the universal functional, we said before, it's the expectation value of the kinetic energy plus electron-electron repulsion using the interacting ground state wave function for density n. And I'll write that as the same expectation value using the non-interacting wave function plus a correction that I call the correlation energy, which is also a functional of n. The Coulomb correlation energy, that is simply the difference between the expectation value of T plus VEE using the interacting and non-interacting wave functions. Uh, so it comes purely from the fact that from the Coulomb correlations that arise within the wave function uh, due to electron-electron repulsion. Uh, <clears throat> and that, uh, that correlation energy is rigorously uh, uh, non-positive. It's less than or equal to zero. Because again, because of the variational principle, uh, uh, psi n is, is the wave function that minimizes T plus VEE. So it has to give a lower expectation value than any other wave function like phi n. We define a Hartree electrostatic energy, uh, which, which is the kind of thing that would, we, we would introduce in classical physics, for instance. It's just the interaction of the density with itself. You've seen that kind of thing arising in classical uh, electrostatics a lot. A lot. Uh, and we define an exchange energy, EX of N, uh, because, so we take the expectation value of the electron-electron repulsion using the non-interacting N-electron wave function, and we write that as the sum of the Hartree energy and the exchange energy. And that defines the exchange energy. And then the exchange correlation energy, which is the only thing we have to approximate in this theory because we can do non-interacting wave functions on a computer. Uh, the exchange correlation energy is just the sum of the exchange energy and the correlation energy. <clears throat> so, so we now have formally exact definitions uh, uh, for the energies the energy and its various pieces. Uh, we, we can uh, evaluate the non-interacting kinetic energy and the Hartree energy exactly because uh, we have explicit expressions for them uh, that don't require anything more than non-interacting wave functions. And the true many-body term, EXC of N, will still have to be approximated. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward now to derive the Cohn-Sham equations for the one electron wave functions because we have the, the Euler equations for the non-interacting and interacting systems that have to have the same solution, N of R, because these systems are defined to have the same density. So for the uh, non-interacting system, uh, functional derivative of Ts with respect to N plus Vs is equal to mu. And uh, for the interacting system, we have some extra terms. 
uh, in the uh, in the in the potential uh, in the potential like term, but the Euler equation is the same. So now I can uh, I uh, uh, since the, these are the same uh, have the equations have the same solution with the same chemical potential. I can identify the Vs of R, which is the cone sham effective potential, to be V of R, the external potential, plus the Hartree potential of the electron density, plus an exchange correlation potential, which is a functional derivative. And, uh, and now we, uh, we, we, we can see that the non-interacting system has uh, spin orbitals, psi alpha of R, which are solutions of a one electron uh, Schrodinger equation uh, using that effective potential that we found on the previous slide. And the electron density for the non-interacting system is simply the sum of the squares of the occupied cone sham orbitals. And the occupations in the ground state should uh, uh, obey the Aufbau principle. So we fill up all the lowest energy states and, and not the higher energy states. Uh, the, uh, the solution of that equation is, is a, uh, has one complication that has to be solved self-consistently because to find the effective potential, you have to know the density. To find the density, you have to know the effective potential. That kind of problem can be solved iteratively. You may need uh, between 10 and 100 iterations to converge. Um, the, um, the kinetic energy we can find explicitly from the orbitals, the occupied orbitals. And the, these cone sham orbitals are what, what are called implicit functionals of the density. That means that if you knew the density, it, once you know the density, these orbitals are determined in principle, but we may not have any, any simple uh, in practice way to uh, uh, any explicit functional for the density that, that gives you the orbitals. But the density certainly determines the orbitals. Uh, we can generalize this theory uh, to spin density, uh, from densities to spin density functional, spin density functionals in a very direct way. Uh, even when the external potential remains spin independent, that still boosts the accuracy of the functional. Uh, so the cone sham self-consistent equations are implemented in many uh, uh, open source and co or commercial computer codes for molecules, solids, defects, liquids, and so on. Uh, there are principles for source of information about ground state energies and electron energy differences, uh, uh, electron densities, spin densities, geometric structures, phonon frequencies, and so on. Um, even the exact cone sham theory doesn't predict the exact fundamental gap of a solid, uh, but there's a generalized cone sham theory in which the exchange correlation potential depends explicitly on the orbitals in a, in a uh, uh, and, and is not a multiplication operator, but is typically a differential or integral operator. And these, these uh, generalized cone sham theories can, in principle, yield the exact energy gaps. Um, okay, uh, I'm taking a little longer with this than I expected, uh, but, but I, I'm coming to the end. So uh, the importance of exact constraints. We have exact expressions for, for the exchange energy and the correlation energy. Uh, and the uh, Coulomb repulsion between the electrons is a simple one over R. So it has been possible over 50 years to derive uh, about 20 mathematical properties of the exact exchange and correlation energies. And we can we call these properties exact constraints. They can be used to constrain the approximations. Uh, they include equality, scaling relations, bounds, limits, and so on. Uh, some of these are satisfied by all widely used approximate functionals, and the more exact constraints that an approximate functional satisfies, the more widely accurate and predictive it can be over the vast material space. Uh, so uh, 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 Aaron Kaplan, Mel Levy, and I have a recent paper about the exact constraints and their predictive power that will appear soon in the annual reviews of physical chemistry. 
Uh, I think I'll skip over the the, the, the various rugs uh, of, of, of approximation. There's the Jacobs ladder of uh, uh, five rungs of density functional approximation, but I'll mention that again in my next talk, so I think I can skip over it here. Loosely speaking, the first three rungs, uh, local spin density generalized gradient approximation and meta generalized gradient approximation are, are computationally semi-local in the sense that uh, the exchange correlation energy and potential at a point is just in space is just determined by the infinitesimal neighborhood of that point. Uh, so the summary of this talk, uh, and density functional theory is rooted in many electron wave function theory. Uh, density functional theory is less accurate than wave function theory, but more computationally efficient for systems with many electrons. It's widely used with reliable accuracy for most SP bonded uh, ground states. Uh, density functional theory has a rigorous underlying exact theory, and that uh, exact theory motivates continuing improvements in the approximations for the exchange correlation energy. Uh, I believe the best way to improve the, uh, the, the, these approximations is to satisfy more and more of the exact constraints. About uh, up to 17 have been satisfied in one approximation so far, but if we can satisfy even a few more, I think we could do much better. Uh, the approximations can become more accurate and predictive when they satisfy more exact constraints. Uh, can we, uh, so I'll, uh, I'll end with a question here. Can we make density functional approximations that are exact for all one electron densities without losing accuracy for systems at equilibrium? And will the resulting fully non-local approximations with symmetry breaking give more reliable descriptions for DRF bonded and strongly correlated systems? Uh, and I'll address some of those questions in, in my research talk, but I'd like to stop now and see if, if there are questions or comments. So let me stop the sharing <clears throat> and turn it over to Andrew. Yes, thank you. Thank you, John. It's an amazing intro introduction. So we're open to questions and uh, the audience can unmute themselves. Feel free to raise your hand or just ask your question directly. And maybe uh, I can start. We have about maybe five minutes for questions. Uh, sure. This intermediate <clears throat> break. So one thing that I'm curious, and this, this is a very general question. So DFT is, is just one way to solve the many-body problem. Uh, do you think that there are possibility that could be other theories, maybe more efficient computationally, completely different in, in a way they're framed mathematically? But we just we just have not moved to that direction yet. Um, yes, I think that's I think that I think that, that there's room for uh, finding more efficient uh, more efficient uh, approaches uh, that are that are highly accurate. Um, I I think it's it's uh, you know I, so so I think for instance one of the things that that, that, is, that I believe is ha happening now. Is that people are are finding ways to do the couple cluster approximation, which is uh, which is a correlated wave, a relatively efficient correlated wave function approach. So people people routinely do do couple cluster calculations now for uh, 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 molecules. Uh, not for so far it hasn't been been done for solids, but I think there will be. I think there's work uh, implementing coupled cluster for solids, and I think that can lead to more accurate results for solids. Uh, there are probably many other ways, and, I, and if you have some thoughts about how to do that, I'd be interested in hearing them too. Um, I suspect that 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 none of these approaches will ever reach the efficiency of density functional theory, but they uh, but but they may be able to extend the accuracy of many uh, of of a uh, coral correlated wave function like approaches to uh, uh, to a, a, a range of larger larger systems I think that I think that is happening interesting thank you um, do you have any questions maybe I can read one question from the chat uh, so sure 
there seem to be a lot of varying opinions on whether the Cam um, Sham one electron orbitals have any physical meaning or can be used for bonding analysis and et cetera. Do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, okay, that's that's a good question too. Uh, so so uh, the, the cohen sham orbitals have an exact physical meaning only for one electron system. <laughs> and and in, in the one electron systems, they are the, um, they are the, uh, uh, the they are the wave function. Uh, they, uh, in the many electron system, I think they still have an approximate meaning, and and, uh, and I think uh, I think you can often often learn a lot from from the Kuhn sham orbitals, for instance, for un understanding chemical bonds. Um, so. So I think in the in the same way in the same way that that uh, uh, one electron wave functions or orbitals have a have an approximate meaning in in correlated wave function theory, they also have an approximate meaning in in density functional theory. Uh, I I don't see any reason to think that they have an exact interpretation, but I think they can help us a lot in understanding what's going on. Okay, and one more question that I maybe I will read from the YouTube chat. Um, what is your opinion on, um, so people predict ground states through machine learning using DFT training and um, then use the AI models to explore larger material space. Uh, what is your opinion on this? So yeah, I think- approaches I, I, that have emerged in the recent, I don't know, five years or so. Right. Yeah. So I think I think that's uh, that's a uh, that's an interesting and important approach, uh, and I think uh, I think um, what it does it's it, it, so it's so the machine learning is a is a much more powerful way to do what people were doing before when they made it empirical or semi-empirical density functionals. So. Uh, uh, the, the density functionals that I like to stress uh, uh, are not empirical in the sense that they're not fitted to bonded systems like molecules. But there's also a lot been a lot of work uh, on human design functionals that that are fitted to uh, to molecular data sets. And I think that machine learning is a much more powerful and systematic way to do that kind of thing, which uh, which which does improve the functionals. In this, in the same way that that empirical fitting approach does, uh, what what I think the, what I think fitting does is to make the functional more interpolative. So, if you have a, a collection of systems that are similar and you you fit to them, then you can get a description of other systems that are like the ones in your in your data set. Uh, the uh, non-empirical functionals that I prefer are, are predictive or extrapolative in the sense that they can predict the properties of systems that are unlike anything in your data set and maybe, maybe systems that have never been imagined before, but can in, can in, in principle exist and may in, and may in fact may in fact actually exist. Uh, so I think the future of density functional theory will have to bring these two approaches together. The functionals, to be predictive, the functionals will have to satisfy many exact constraints, but to be accurately interpolative, they'll have to fit to large data sets. And uh, uh, so I see that as, as the way to go in the future. Okay, very interesting. All right, John, I think maybe we can continue. Uh, at, at the end, you can ask as many questions as you want. So um, it's just a message to the audience. Okay, uh, so I'll go back to the screen sharing. Okay, so slideshow. <laughs>
And somehow I went to the end there, so I have to go back to the beginning. Oh, wait a minute, that's, that's, that's the wrong talk. I don't know how that happened because I think I clicked on the right one. I'm sorry about that. I'll have to go back and try it again. So now it's doing something very strange. It, uh, when I click on slideshow, it tells me to resume slideshow. And when I resume slideshow, I go back to the old, the previous talk. So Did you close the previous talk. Ah, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. That's what I have to do. Sorry, sorry for this delay. So to close it, I think I can do escape. Is that right? Or yeah, I didn't close it. Uh, see you can I... click on the screen and then click escape. It should close this presentation. Okay, I'll try. In show, I think that's it. Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. I never, never did a talk with two different files before, so I am learning. Okay, so uh, so this is the research talk. It's about more predictive density functional symmetry breaking and strong correlation in density functional theory. I, I want to acknowledge discussions I've had about symmetry breaking and density functional theory with Alex Zunger, Mark Peterson, Hardy Gross, and Jen Wei Sun. And I want to acknowledge the many many collaborators who have worked uh, uh, with me on the projects that I'm going to describe, and they, their names are listed here. Uh, the uh, the exact cone sham theory uh, would describe the ground states of all materials, whether they're simple materials or complex materials. And exact expressions are known for the density functional for the exchange correlation energy. But their evaluation is impractical. You saw some of those exact expressions in the last uh, uh, talk. Uh, so in practice, uh, this exchange correlation energy functional must be approximated. Uh, however, the existence of the exact expressions is what permits the derivation of the exact mathematical properties uh, of, of the functional we're approximating. And uh, complex materials, which are, I, I would say, materials in which there are many many uh, uh, states competing. The challenge of complex materials is to make the approximation accurate enough and reliable enough to capture those small energy differences between competing states or phases. Uh, so model, uh, uh, a popular approach in, in physics is still to use model Hamiltonians with fitted parameters. Uh, that's a popular approach for complex systems in physics, but it's not general enough and it's not material specific enough for materials discovery because basically you have to know <laughs> that the system exists and you have to know some of its properties before you can, before you can use um, model Hamiltonians. So there are two different approaches to construct the density functional approximations. 
Uh, they're both widely used. Uh, the first one is to fit to a data set of real bonded systems like molecules, typically also satisfying a few exact constraints and appropriate norms. Uh, this approach is what I would call the more interpolative approach. It's often more accurate for systems that are similar to those that are being fitted. And machine learning, uh, related to the question we just had, is a new and very powerful way to do this. Uh, the second approach is to satisfy many exact, constra exact constraints uh, and appropriate norms. So the exact constraints are the mathematical properties of the exact density functional, like equalities, bounds, scaling relations, limits. And the appropriate norms are non-bonded systems for which the approximation should be very accurate. I'll give you some examples of that later. So this second approach is a more first principles approach and it's more widely predictive. Uh, it predicts bonds. It doesn't fit bonds because there's no bond. There's no bonded system in the uh, construction of the functional. Uh, and the question is, how accurately can this predict over the immense space of possible bonded materials? Uh, so here are some of the computationally efficient density functional approximations that have been constructed by the constraint-based approach that I talked about before. The first one is the local spin density approximation from Cohn and Sham, 1965. Uh, this, uh, this is a local uh, approximation for the exchange correlation energy in which the exchange correlation energy density at a point in three-dimensional space only depends on the up and down electron spin densities at that point. Uh, it, it, it's designed to be exact for the, uh, in the limit of a uniform density because we know the exact exchange correlation energy density of a uniform electron gas. From quantum Monte Carlo calculations, we know it at very high accuracy. Uh, <clears throat> then at the, uh, uh, that's the first rung of the Jacobs ladder of approximations. And on the second rung, we have the, the Purdue, Burke, Aaron Zerhoff, or PBE generalized gradient approximation from 1996. Uh, if we count exact constraints, the local density approximation actually satisfies nine, nine of the known exact constraints, even though it was proposed before any of these exact constraints were known. Uh, and that's because it inherits those exact constraints from a, its appropriate norm, the uniform electron gas. Uh, the, the PBE GGA was designed to explicitly satisfy 11 exact constraints and the uniform density appropriate norm. Uh, and it generally improves the accuracy over uh, LSDA for molecules and solids. Uh, on the third rung, we have uh, the meta generalized gradient approximations. So, so what we do as we, as we go up the ladder of, of density functional approximation is we add more ingredients to the, uh, the energy density. The energy density, the exchange correlation energy density is a function of some local ingredients like the electron spin densities and the local spin density approximation. In the generalized gradient approximation, we add the gradients of our, our first derivatives of local spin density densities. And in the meta GJ, we also add the, the up and down spin orbital kinetic energy densities, which come from the orbitals. Uh, so this theory is, is actually an, an implicit functional of the density, but it's still semi-local in the sense that if you, if you do a Cohn-Sham calculation, the orbitals are available to you and they're available to you locally. So you can actually make, you can actually construct the energy density from the local ingredients at a point. Uh, and uh, SCAN, the strongly constrained and appropriately normed meta GGA, uh, comes from uh, work I did with Janway Sun and Adrian Ruzinski in 2015. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, the most constraint satisfying of the semi local functionals. It satisfies all 17 uh, exact constraints that a meta GGA form can satisfy. There are, some, there are about three exact constraints that require a fully non-local form that it doesn't satisfy. 
Um, the appropriate norms for scan, of course, include the uniform densities, which uh, are also used in the two lower rungs of the, of the ladder, uh, but they also include closed shell atoms. Uh, in particular, rare gas atoms uh, are used as an appropriate norm, and, uh, and we can make the functional extremely accurate with errors in, in the exchange energy, exchange correlation energy on the order of a uh, fraction of a percent for these systems, uh, for, for the, the rare gas atoms. And Scan like uh, uh, PB and LSD is not fitted to any bonded multi-center system. There are reasons for that, uh, technical reasons, which I don't have time to explain, but I could, could try an answer to a question. So the, the scan construction uh, it, it follows the, the following route. There are some exact constraints that, that apply to all electron densities. Uh, and then there are many exact constraints that cluster around the slowly varying densities or the one and two electron densities. These are the these are two limits, and, and many exact constraints are defined just for one limit or the other. So we can construct simple functionals for each of those two cases, and then we can interpolate between them. And the, the interpolation parameter is a dimensionless function of position, uh, alpha of r. It's constructed from the, 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 the semi-local ingredients, namely the local spin densities, the gradients of the local spin densities, and the positive orbital kinetic energy densities, up and down spin. Uh, and it's constructed in such a way, it, it's, it's actually constructed, it's actually constructed, it's the alpha is actually an ingredient of the electron localization function that, that Becca proposed. And what, uh, what alpha can do is it can recognize one and two electron densities. It can recognize uniform or slowly varying densities. And it can also recognize regions of density tail overlap. Uh, and uh, scan interpolates between the first two regions and it extrapolates to the third. Uh, so I'm going to list some of the successes and failures of SCAN relative to earlier semi-local functionals. SCAN is much better for uh, water, at, at, uh, liquid wa including liquid water, water clusters, ice, water at interfaces. It's much better for ferroelectrics where there's a spontaneous distortion that produces a a local electric polarization in the system. Uh, for the formation energies and ground state crystal structures of strongly bonded solids, um, SCAN does a much better job of predicting the crystal structures and the energy differences between uh, different structures and also the formation energies from standard states. Uh, SCAN is better for the critical pressures for structural phase transitions of semiconductors. <clears throat> it's even better uh, than previous semi-local functionals for some of the so-called strongly correlated materials. Strongly correlated materials usually, but not always, involve D or F electrons. Um, there are some strongly correlated materials for which SCAN seems to give the right answer without any, uh, any additional correction. One of them is uh, are the materials that are constructed as uh, polymorphs of manganese dioxide all come out very well with SCAN. The high temperature superconducting materials uh, also, uh, also come out very well with SCAN. Uh, I'll mention that in a minute. Uh, you get the right uh, gap closing under doping, the right spin moment on the copper atom, you get stripes and stripe fluctuations and so on. All these things come out from the scan functional without any additional input. Uh, you, the geometric and mechanical properties of materials, including two-dimensional materials, the surface energies of metals, all very good with scan. Uh, this slide is about the... Uh, uh, Lanthanum strontium copper oxide, which is one of the uh, high temperature superconducting materials. It's a layered material with uh, um, <clears throat> layers of copper atoms that are, are separated by um, uh, 
tetrahedra, uh, oxygen uh, surrounding other atoms. And uh, the, uh, it, we can dope this material with, uh, uh, the, the pristine material is just lanthanum uh, copper oxide. And it's it, it experimentally an insulator. And of course it doesn't superconduct. But if you if you dope this material with uh, strontium and the strontium replaces some of the lanthanums, uh, then uh, at 25% uh, uh, strontium doping, the gap opens up. Uh, there's a the phase transition to an insulate. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, yeah, there's a phase transition to the metallic state, and then super superconductivity occurs. And we can't explain the superconductivity. That's too fine an energy level scale. But we can explain the material in which the superconductivity arises using scan. So uh, on the on the left here, you see the density of one electron states versus one electron energy for the pristine in lanthanum uh, copper oxide under the approximation in the PBE, it's a, it, it's a metal because, uh, because at the Fermi level, there's a non-zero density of states. Fermi level is this Problem with scan, you see that a gap which is uh, closes, uh, and that uh, twenty five percent doping, which is the right concentration, the the gap disappears, and the material becomes a metal, and then it can superconduct. So that's we're very happy with that result. Uh, in in chemistry, uh, scan has been tested on Stefan Grimma's large GMTKN fifty five suite. That's a suite of 55 molecular data sets. Uh, for, uh, it, it's generalized main group. For the, so these are S and P bonded molecules. And we include thermochemistry and kinetics and also non-covalent interactions like Van der Waals interactions and hydrogen bonds in, in this set. And, and on that set from 2017, uh, in, in, the, in the original 2017 paper, SCAN was actually found to be the best meta-GGA tested, and it outperformed all of the LSDAs and GGAs, all of the other, uh, other meta-GGAs, and it even outperformed some of the hybrid functionals. So the hybrid functionals mix in some exact exchange. Uh, in some codes, that's very costly, uh, but... Uh, uh, the hybrid functionals typically don't satisfy more, more exact constraints than their underlying approximation, and, and SCAN satisfies a lot of exact constraints. Now, I wanted to argue that uh, SCAN is predictive, uh, and one, ev one, uh, one evidence for that is that in, in this GMTKN55 data set, there's a so-called mindless benchmarking set of artificial molecules. These, these molecules uh, are, are uh, 16, uh, 16 atoms bonded together, uh, <clears throat> different atoms uh, bonded together in different ways. Uh, they're uh, uh, artificial because they, you don't normally see them in nature. Uh, uh, they're not used to fit other functionals. But they can exist uh, either uh, either in, in a stable or at least in a metastable state. Uh, I think most of them are metastable. Uh, and uh, uh, these were computed uh, uh, by various functionals, including SCAN. And SCAN turned out to be much better for these functionals than the other functionals tested. Uh, and of course, the other functionals were, were fitted to, to uh, typical molecules in the GMTKN55 set, but not to these mindless benchmark sets. So that's evidence of predictability. Uh, now I want to give you the rest of the story because it, everything is not perfect. In density functional theory, it's never the case that every, so far at least, that everything is perfect. 
Uh, you can find that SCAN is somewhat better than the previous for, for instance, band gaps of insulin and sham implementation where the uh, effective exchange correlation potential is, is an operator, a differential or integral operator. That uh, that you can hope to get a, a a gap in the bands in the uh, eigenvalue spectrum, which is comparable to the uh, uh, experimental gap or the exact fundamental gap, and uh, scan gives some improvement in these uh, fundamental gaps, but it's modest. I wouldn't. It's not as good as what the hybrid functionals give. Um, for most transition metal oxides, now, now for some transition metal oxides, as I told you, SCAN is perfect without any correction. But for other transition metal oxides, uh, SCAN still needs a plus U or, uh, or uh, inexpensive self-interaction correction. Uh, but uh, what, but the plus U, the value of U is much smaller, uh, maybe 60% of the value in PBE, so so scan is is in a sense more self interaction free than PBE or LDA, but it's still not perfectly self interaction free, and it still needs a plus U correction in most of the transition metal oxides. Emily Carter and her collaborators uh, uh, found that, um, and and finally, scan is actually somewhat worse than the PBE GGA or the Laplacian level meta GGAs, which use the Laplacian of the density instead of the kinetic energy density. For uh, for instance, the formation energies, the magnetic uh, moments, and the the vacancy energies in transition metals like iron or platinum. Where the, some problems were found with scan from Isaacson, Wolverton, and David Singh. Uh, we understand that now. We think we understand that now because in in a metal, there's there's a very strong uh, screening, uh, uh, and the exact exchange correlation hole in a metal is is a sort of screened version of the exact exchange hole, uh, and it's screened down to very short uh, a very short range. So it's actually better described by functionals that are that 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 are explicit functionals of the density and are explicitly short range functionals like um, uh, LDA or P or, or like PBE GGA or like uh, Laplacian level meta GGAs than it is by using tau, which the the orbital kinetic energy density, which is a fully non local functional of the density. These are not big errors, but they, but 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 still they are uh, still the errors are smaller in the simpler functionals for some of these transition metals. Uh, scan also makes extra demands on the mesh for integration over real space, and has some problems for pseudo-potential construction. Uh, these problems were related to the uh, imperfect smoothness of the original scan functional, and they've been fixed in a functional called R two scan. From uh, James Furness and uh, and collaborators in 2020. So, so R2 scan is actually our preferred uh, preferred meta GGA now because it's it's uh, it has uh, uh, has about the same accuracy as scan with with uh, without some of the comp numerical problems. Uh, so uh, the uh, the scan family of functionals is usually more accurate than the PBE GGA for a modest, maybe factor of three increase in the computational cost. And without being fitted to any multi-center bonded system, these scan functionals describe diverse bonds, uh, covalent, metallic, hydrogen, and intermediate range van der Waals bonds. Um, SCAN has been adopted by the material project, materials project at Berkeley for the calculation of the properties of about 156 known solid materials. These are materials for which the experimental crystal, crystal structure is known. And uh, uh, the, the current uh, materials project database is based on PBE or PBE plus U, and they're switching now to SCAN. 
it, it'll take a while to complete the process because there are a lot of materials to be calculated. Uh, second part of my talk now is about symmetry breaking and strong correlation and density functional theory. Uh, I got interested in this subject. Well, I, I think I was interested in this subject back in the 1970s. Uh, and then I, uh, I got interested in it again recently. Um, <clears throat> Quantum mechanics suggests that any isolated finite system has a symmetry unbroken ground state wave function. There's a theorem that says that uh, that, that uh, you can simultaneously diagonalize the Hamiltonian and the symmetry operators that commute with it. Uh, and so uh, that symmetry unbroken wave function could be strongly correlated if the corresponding cone-sham system, the non-interacting system, has nearly degenerate ground states of the same symmetry, because then uh, many different cone-sham configurations can be strongly mixed by a relatively weak electron-electron uh, uh, interaction. Uh, and standard uh, density functional approximations capture normal correlation, but not strong correlation, except, to, of course, at very low density, where the even the uniform gas has strong correlation. Uh, but, uh, but what I want to stress here is that a good density functional, like SCAN, can often capture the ground state energy of a symmetry unbroken, strongly correlated state. Uh, the, the symmetry breaking yields, uh, yields a, a normally correlated state, uh, because, uh, because strong correlation typically comes from, from from degeneracy, degeneracy comes from symmetry. If you break the symmetry, you break the degeneracy, you kill the strong correlation, you go back to normal correlation, which density functionals can describe. That's one of one of several arguments for the for, for symmetry breaking in density functional theory. There are other arguments too. Uh, now the symmetry broken ground states are not true eigenstates, at least in finite systems like atoms and molecules. Uh, they're, they're states that have small energy uncertainties and thus long lifetimes. And those lifetimes can increase with the system size. So back in 1972, Phil, Phil Anderson wrote a famous uh, essay uh, in, in, in science called uh, More is Different. And he argued in there that symmetries break when time dependent density, the time dependent. Uh, density or spin density fluctuations, which are always present even in a stationary state, but are accessible only in time-dependent density functional theory. When those, uh, uh, or when those fluctuations drop to low or zero frequency, then they freeze out and form a broken symmetry state. Uh, and Anderson argued in particular that antiferromagnetism, which has definitely been observed in solids for a long time, is a symmetry breaking. It breaks the spin symmetry, but it's a symmetry breaking that can persist for a long time, for years, maybe centuries, who, who knows how long. Okay, so, so I'm gonna give you an example of uh, symmetry breaking where we can actually do a calculation to confirm Anderson's interpretation of symmetry breaking. Uh, and that's because it happens in a very simple system. It happens in gelium. Gelium is a, a, a uniform positive background neutralized by electrons. Uh, when the electron density is high, the, uh, the background density is uniform, and we have to recover the uniform electron gas. And as the uh, density gets uh, lower, the, the, there's a, a phase transition from a uniform density to a non-uniform density. Uh, which ha which has been found in the quantum Monte Carlo calculations for the for for gelium, uh, and uh, it's a uh, it, it's the formation of a, uh, a static charge density wave. In other words, uh, the electron density is not uniform, but it crinkles up into waves, uh, and eventually localize. Eventually, the density localizes into a, a Wigner crystal in which you have one electron on each lattice site in the extreme low density limit. Uh, 
uh, you have a, a BCC Wigner crystal with one electron on each lattice site, and that's the lowest energy state. So the quantum Monte Carlo calculations from separately and older 1980 predict a transition at a, a density parameter RS between 65 and 105. Uh, this this RS parameter is uh, is the in, inverse. Uh, in, so there's a Fermi wave vector which is kf, uh, and that's uh, that varies inversely with RS. And RS is the density parameter which uh, is defined so that uh, the electron density uh, is one atom per sphere uh, in a sphere of radius four pi RS. Uh, radius RS and volume four pi RS cubed over three. So this 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 uh, this range of RSs is, is very low, much lower than the physical densities in real systems, but it's accessible to the quantum Monte Carlo calculation. The wave vector of the charge density wave in, in these calculations is found to be about uh, two point three times the Fermi wave vector. Uh, which is consistent with the uh, formation of a Wigner lattice at low density. So, so, so we can study this uh, transition through the dynamic density response function of time-dependent density functional theory. I haven't talked about time. In my first talk, I only discussed ground state density functional theory because that's the most mature and uh, uh, approach with the most accurate approximations. But there's also a time-dependent density functional theory it gives you access to time-dependent densities, even in, in systems where the external potential may in fact depend on time, though well, it doesn't have to. Uh, so we can use this time-dependent density functional theory to construct a dynamic density response function chi for the uniform gas. So we start with a uh, with, we start with a uh, uniform phase of the uh, 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 of jellium. And we uh, uh, apply a weak external perturbation to it, delta V. Uh, delta V is a wave with wave vector Q and frequency omega. And then we find a density response, delta N, at the same wave vector and frequency, uh, which is proportional to delta V. And the proportionality constant is this density response function which is a function of RS, the density uh, parameter of, of the, the jellium, the wave vector Q, and the frequency omega. We have a formally exact expression for chi uh, in this Dyson equation. Um, chi is chi, uh, it depends on chi zero, which is the density response function for the cone-sham non-interacting system. And, can be com computed exactly. It's the Lindhard function, basically. Uh, and uh, it also depends on the, cool, the Fourier transform of the Coulomb interaction for pi over Q squared. And it depends on an exchange correlation kernel, FXC, which is a function of RS, Q, and omega. So just like in ground state theory, there's a contribution from the Hartree energy and a contribution from the exchange correlation energy. Here in this correction to the non-interacting response function, we have a contribution from the heart, uh, from the uh, direct Coulomb interaction and a contribution from exchange and correlation. Uh, and this is a uh, this Dyson equation is uh, an equation for chi in terms of chi, but it can be solved for chi. So. Uh, uh, so it can be solved, uh, solved algebraically for the interacting response function if you know the kernel. So how can we find the kernel, uh, the exchange correlation kernel? Well, we tried using the same approach of satisfaction of exact constraints that we've used earlier to construct the exchange correlation energy for ground state density functional theory. And this is work that was done with Adrian Ruzinski, uh, Chema Patarki and Adrian Student, Naraj Nepal in, in 2020. Uh, the, um, uh, what, we found, what we found is we get two different, two different but equivalent descriptions of the symmetry breaking in, the, in, the, uh, in jellium, the, the formation of the charge density wave. The first one we got from ground state DFT that only requires the zero frequency density response function. And that response function we can calculate 
uh, from a, we only need the static kernel to calculate that. We uh, uh, we found that it diverges at exactly the right wave vector. Uh, Q equals 2.3 kf, and it diverges at RS equals 69, which is within the range of of the uh, those found by quantum Monte Carlo. Uh, then we did the same calculation with time dependent DFT. Uh, and, and here we have non-zero frequencies, and we define a spectral function S of Rs, Q, and omega, which is minus one over pi times the density times the imaginary part of the uh, fre frequency-dependent density response function chi. This, this, uh, this spectral function is also called the dynamic structure factor of the electron liquid. It appears in the random phase approximation for the uh, correlation energy. It, it appears in many places. Uh, and it has a, the interesting feature that it, it allows you to identify the, uh, uh, the excitations of the system as, as poles of the density response function. So what we found in our, in, in our study is that Anderson was actually right. And loosely speaking, the static charge density wave is just a soft plasmon. It's a, it's a plasmon or, or a dynamic uh, uh, charge density wave uh, which softens uh, to zero frequency at the critical wave vector in RS. The paper that discusses that is this Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences paper in 2021. And you can see it in this picture. Uh, so in this picture, we have calculated uh, <clears throat> The average, uh, the average over all frequencies for a given wave vector Q weighted by the spectral function uh, S of Q and omega. Uh, and that uh, on the vertical axis, uh, that quantity is divided by the bulk plasma frequency at zero frequency, uh, at zero, fre I mean, the bulk plasma frequency uh, at zero wave vector for, uh, for jellium. So, so we calculated those quantities. Now, Rs equals four is a density of metallic sodium, a real material. And in that system, we see that the, that the plasma disperses, disperses upward. Its, its frequency just increases with increasing wave vector. And we don't see any charge density wave instability. Uh, when we go to Rs equals 69, which is the critical density we calculate for uh, the charge density wave, we see the plasmon is dispersing downward. So the solid orange line is a downward plasmon dispersion, which is not surprising because people have seen that, have found that before for jellium. But we now can continue that line beyond the point where the, where the plasmon starts to break up into um, electron hole pairs. We can still continue it, and we see that the uh, uh, that the uh, that this average frequency drops to zero, and it drops to zero at the right critical wave vector, at the right critical density. <clears throat> so the average over the spectral function of the frequency of a density fluctuation or wave vector Q in jellium uh, drops to zero uh, at the critical wave vector and creates the charge density wave. Uh, in simple language, the the the, uh, uh, the the dynamic density fluctuations freeze out, and that's the symmetry breaking because it breaks the translational symmetry of of the jellium Hamiltonian. Okay, uh, now in the last part of my talk, I want to discuss symmetry breaking in a real material, and because we have a better handle on the density functions for S and P bonded materials than we for, do for D and F materials. I want to focus on, uh, on a rare SP bonded system, which is strongly correlated. It's the, uh, the singlet uh, ground state of the carbon dimer, C2. Uh, at its equilibrium bond length, it's strongly correlated due to a near degeneracy at the non-interacting level with another state of the same symmetry. There's an avoided crossing near the equilibrium bond length. Uh, 
in the uh, uh, this this has been found in correlated wave functions, for instance, in this paper by Alavi and, collabor and collaborators. They made a very careful study of the strong correlation in the carbon dimer. Uh, the carbon atom and the, the triplet uh, ex first excited state of C2, however, are normally correlated. So this is a special feature of the singlet ground state of the carbon dimer. Uh, now, we can do uh, self-consistent LSDA and PBE calculations uh, that, that do, in fact, uh, break the symmetry, uh, but they're not accurate enough to identify singlet C2 as a strongly correlated molecule because the errors of the functionals are comparable to the, the energy of strong correlation. Uh, the unnudged scan meta GGA is accurate enough to show us that, in fact, this is a strongly correlated molecule. That's the first step, first claim I'm going to make here. Uh, because I'm going to show you the mean absolute errors in electron volts for the atomization energies of the six normally correlated small representative molecules in the AE6 test set. Uh, uh, so uh, for the Hartree Fock exchange, for Hartree Fock theory, the error is pretty big. It's 6.3 electron volts. Uh, uh, the mean absolute error is 6.3 electron volts. When we go to LSDXC, exchange and correlation, we already do better, and we get the error down to 3.3 electron volts, but that's still pretty bad. Uh, when we go to the PBE generalized gradient approximation, that error comes down to 6 tenths of an electron volt. That's a big improvement, but it's still uh, it's still uh, big enough to throw off the prediction of strong correlation in the system. When we get to the scan meta GGA, the error is only 0.1 electron volts, or one tenth, uh, or one percent of the atomization energy, and uh, the the uh, uh, that's accurate enough. So if we do a scan calculation for C2 without symmetry breaking we find that it gives an anomalously large error for the binding energy of the molecule, for the energy to break the molecule up into two carbon atoms. Instead of the, the normal 0.1 uh, uh, electron volt error, it's, it's an, uh, uh, the symmetry unbroken scan gives a 1.4 electron volt underbinding for singlet C2. That's huge in comparison with its, uh, with its uh, more typical errors. And it tells us that this is a system which is indeed strongly correlated. But we can go beyond that and do the symmetry breaking with scan and, show, and you'll see what happens. So we do the uh, atomization energy of singlet C2 from several functionals without symmetry breaking, that's without SB and with symmetry breaking with SB and then I'll take the difference of the two. Uh, the exact atomization from full CI quantum Monte Carlo, 6.2 electron volts. In LSDA, if you don't do symmetry breaking, symmetry breaking, you get some improvement to 7E. Uh, you start out 6.0, break, you actually make it worse. I a message that my internet connection is unstable. Are you still seeing me and hearing the slides? Hello? Yes, we do. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to check. Sometimes I lose the internet connection. Yeah, it was a bit of a uh, interruption. So if you can repeat the last, say, 10 seconds of your talk. Could be oh, okay. I will do that. Yes. So just from this slide, right? Uh, yeah, so so uh, so what I'm showing you in this slide is that uh, if we do uh, the scan meta GGA with uh, for the atomization energy of singlet C2 ground state without symmetry breaking, uh, we get a, a, a binding energy of 4.8 electron volts, which is much less than the 6.2 from experiment. But if we allow the symmetry to break, allow the spin symmetry to break in the molecule, uh, we get 6.2, which is, is exactly, perhaps fortuitously, exactly the same as the full CI quantum Monte Carlo calculation. Uh, when the symmetries break uh, in this molecule, the net spin densities are 
not on the ends of the molecular bond, but they're on the sides. So there's an interesting pattern. It's actually the same pattern that was found earlier for the GGA. But notice that the energy gets much more sensitive to the symmetry breaking as you increase the sophistication of the functional and the symmetry broken energy becomes more accurate. So what I am hoping is that, that this is a that this feature will persist uh, even for strongly correlated systems that are S and D like, and that um, if we if we if we start from a good functional and then uh, break the symmetry, allow the symmetry to break spontaneously, uh, then we will find uh, <clears throat> good ground state energy differences. I don't know that that's the case. I hope that's the case. Okay, <clears throat> so the last part of my talk, I, I want to go through very fast because I want to give you time for, for questions. Uh, but I think that full non-locality uh, is the old and new frontiers. It's old because we were trying to make non-local functionals back in the 1970s, and even and in 1981, I made one with Alex Unger called the Purdue Zunger Self-Interaction Correction. Uh, but uh, non-locality is really needed to make the, make the functional self-interaction free or to make them exact for all one electron densities. It's needed because the Hartree energy is non-local. So in a non-interacting, in a, in a one electron system, the exchange correlation, the self-exchange correlation energy has to cancel the self-Hartree energy. Since the self hartree energy is non-local, the self-exchange correlation energy has to be non-local too. Uh, and so back in the 1981, I proposed a self-interaction correction with Alex Unger as a way to make any functional exact for uh, all one electron densities. And it does that, but unfortunately it has the, it has the, a nasty feature that uh, for many electron systems, it can make the approximate functional much worse than without the self-interaction correction. So that's the problem we have to address. We're trying to address that now. Uh, and I'm going to just move ahead to the conclusions of this part of the talk. Uh, density functionals for the exchange correlation energy of a many electron system become more accurate and more widely predictive when they're designed to satisfy more exact constraints and appropriate norms. I've seen a lot of examples of that. I believe it is to be true. Uh, SCAN is a good but imperfect uh, non-empirical semi-local functional, which because it's semi-local, it's also computationally efficient. Uh, much of the full non-locality of the functional can be restored by making, a, uh, I believe, a modified Purdue's Unger self-interaction correction that doesn't lose the correct slowly varying limit. We don't have that yet. We're working on it. It hasn't been easy, <laughs> but uh, we think it's worth the effort. And finally, uh, density functional theory with symmetry breaking is starting to correctly describe the ground states of strongly correlated and complex systems. Um, there's still a lot of work on that, but I have hopes that at least, at least in some strongly correlated systems, in more than we can now do, that we'll be able to do uh, accurate and reliable density functional calculations. So I'm going to stop there and see if there are any questions. Thank you so much, John. Uh, it was a very long <laughs> but extremely enlightening talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we're I'm open. sorry. I'm sorry it was so long. I thought it would be. Oh, no, long. no. It, that, that's the good thing. No, I guess it's uh, that's <laughs> what we really strive for, right? Uh, yeah. So we are open to questions, and I think the audience is free to ask. I'm really, I apologize for uh, turning off the video because of the connection. I typically, turn off the videos for everyone. Now you can turn on your video and ask questions. And maybe I can uh, start with uh, several questions from the chat. One was about your opinion. Um, uh, so he, uh, the, the question is, there is an opinion that ab initio methods are superior to DFT methods. What do you think about this? Uh, ab initio methods are superior to DFT methods in accuracy, but, uh, but they are inferior in, in computational efficiency. So, so uh, 
I, I tried, uh, I, I, I think we, we need both. <laughs> we need the functionals to be accurate, reliable, and predictive. We also need them to be computationally efficient. Now, of course, <clears throat> computational power increases all the time. And it's possible that the and, and algorithms for the implementation of these these ab initio methods I, actually I, it, it, it's it, it's a, it's an interesting question whether DFT is ab initio or not. Um, I, I would say that the, the DFT with uh, with the satisfaction of exact constraints is not as ab initio as a correlated wave function theory, but it's it's more efficiency. And I think that will happen by a combination of things. Um, yeah, but I think, I think we're going to need the FP for a long time it's going to be a long time before you can use ab initio methods for that, I think, unless, unless quantum computers somehow are able to do it. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, Christopher, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, good morning, John. Um, morning. So, yeah, thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, I actually had two questions. I'm going to skip my first one here and go to the C2, C2 point. Um, you picked C2. It's an interesting example, as I'm sure you know. That's somewhat contentious. This is the electronic structure of C2. Uh, I guess Henry Rezepa and Roald Hoffman and other people had, you know, chimed in over the years. Um, when you say single, okay, actually, actually, I was I wasn't aware of that, Chris. So maybe you could say a little about that. Oh, okay, yeah. So uh, there was a there was a sort of a famous dialogue back when Angavanta Kemi was publishing. Um, you know, like transactions as like almost like verbal discussions between scientists. And um, this famous paper is called, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember, one molecule, two atoms, three views, four bonds. Um, I see. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I guess the, the, uh, this idea of singlet C2 is something that is, that is definitely one of the possible configurations, right? But I guess there are two types of singlet C2 that one could compute. There could be a, a pair where the electrons are bonded in one orbital, or there could be some, sep, you know, spatially separated spin up, spin down configuration. Um, and I'm curious, as when you say singlet C2, what, what are we, what are we actually computing here? Okay, I I lost the uh, I lost your voice. I lost the connection. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Uh, may, so I heard most of what you said uh, about the possibilities of different spin configurations of a single state and so on. <clears throat> yeah. Right. So. So the, the, there's just, it's whether the electrons are in a you know in a an orbital that is seemingly bonding and you know spin up mm -hmm. spin down it's the same orbital or whether they are perhaps in some configuration that is spatially separated like a super exchange if you like uh, yes an, yes uh -huh. paramagnetic ordering if you want to think of it this right way. right yeah that is so, a broken uh, symmetry so, though right that, that is a, that's that, right that's symmetry with wave functions yeah. Yeah. Okay. So when you're saying singlet, when you're saying singlet C two, we're referring to this the broken symmetry configuration. Uh, that's it's it's a broken symmetry configuration that we find in density functional theory. That's right. What, okay. All, yeah. all my symmetry breaking is in in DFT, but uh -huh. that's what we find. We find that uh, we find that uh, uh, it, it, it's not exactly it's not exactly completely different orbitals in the, in, in the solution that we find. We find that 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 the upspin orbital and the downspin orbital are different, but yeah. they're both they're both bonding orbitals. Uh -huh. <clears throat> um, Andrew, do I do I have time to ask my second one while I'm on camera here? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. When All I right, John, I got one more for you. I, I so sort of going back to the first half of your talk, I actually use a very similar introduction to teach my computational chemistry class, the sort of the, the nuances of uh, DFT's implementation. And actually for homework, uh, two, two classes ago, I assigned them your 
science paper from 2017 where you made the case that we're straying from the exact DFT functional in favor of either energy or density. Um, and I wanted to ask you about that, uh, if you could expand upon that as to why we are unable to stray towards the exact functional. Ah, okay. So, so yeah. So, uh, when when we said that the DFT is straying from the exact <clears throat> from the path toward the exact functional, we were we were making a, a reference to uh, to semi empirical functionals, which have become very popular in chemistry, uh, and. Uh, not to all of them, but to the ones that are, are uh, that have so many parameters that they are effectively overfitted. Uh, so if if you have more parameters than can be justified by the quality of the approximation and the data that you have, then you start to develop odd uh, kinks in the functional uh, uh, non-analyticities that shouldn't be there. And that leads to errors in the density that are actually observable. You can actually, if you calculate the electron density, you can see that there are errors in the density that are coming from these oscillations in the in the functional. And so that's what we were trying to say. I think the uh, I think the uh, the uh, uh, constraint satisfaction approach in density functional theory is not straying from the path to the exact functional. But it's a very slow path. <laughs> it's a long path that, that involves a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of work and a lot of trial and error to make to make everything come out right. <clears throat> Great, thank you, uh, Andreas. Uh, hi, good uh, morning, and thanks a lot for your very nice talk. Uh, you're from morning. Mexico. Um, John, one question uh, about the... Um, yeah, good, good to see you, Andrea. Yeah. yeah, good to see you too. Yeah, we, we have met before, yeah. yeah. Uh, on, on, the, on the excitations of the response functions you were discussing on the homogeneous electron gas, where you then saw basically these density fluctuations, um, I'm wondering if you do this, for example, with the standard implementation of TDDFT, also with a RPA implementation, uh, you do see poles that have intensities, and you do see poles when you calculate that don't have intensities. You have both of them. Now, mm -hmm. the question for me is, if you think about this in terms of correlation energy, are both poles contributing to the RPA correlation energies, or do only the poles contribute to the correlation energy that have intensities? Okay, by, by intensities, do you mean that the, uh, that the, the uh, structure factor, S, the imaginary part of the structure factor is, right. is, is, is non-zero? Exactly. Yeah. Right. I, uh, I think probably only the, only the ones that have intensities contribute to the correlation. Okay. Okay, yeah, be this is, yeah, because yeah. in RPA, the, the, the expression for the correlation energy involves right. that imaginary part of S of Q and omega. Okay, because I mean, a question is, uh, do you have a simple method how to sort this out? Because I mean, if you come from the orbital picture, also from the molecular uh, picture, which we have, uh, we, we basically uh, use a diagonalization approach, but uh, we only... Um, we can only use an iterative diagonalization approach because this uh, matrix is much, much too large. And so I, I'm wondering if there is a method more out of an analytical approach to sort this out. Uh, we haven't really, really worked on that or even thought about it very much, but I think it's a good question. Uh, uh, all that we have done for uh, charge density waves was done for gelium. Uh, okay. Gelium, uh, in gelium, we, we can actually evaluate the correlation energy. We, we have uh, we have evaluated the the correlation energy of uh, of the symmetry unbroken gelium at at all densities, hundred or something like that. 
using using uh, using an RPA like expression, but with the kernel, the exchange correlation kernel, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. which in principle would make the RPA exact, but in practice, of course, if it's an approximate kernel, it just makes it better. And what we found is that with the same kernel that gave us the um, uh, gave us the uh, uh, static charge density we, density wave, we also got accurate uh, uh, correlation energies for the uniform gas for all RS okay. from zero up to about a hundred. Mm -hmm. Symmetry broken. We haven't tried the symmetry breaking. Okay. Okay. I suspect the energy is going to be very very close for the symmetry yeah. broken solution. Mm -hmm. okay. one. We haven't tried it. Okay. Thank you so much. No? I will. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. So, Rob, you, you wanted to ask a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, Thank you so much for the talk, Professor Purdue. Um, so, one very quick clarification, and I guess one more, like, more philosophical question. Um, sure. uh, so, the clarification when you say symmetry broken, is that the same thing as just like an unrestricted DFT calculation or spin polarized? You have like an alpha and a beta density matrix. Uh, yes, in, in in this case for the the singlet C two, that's what we did. We did a spin spin unrestricted calculation. Symmetry breaking in general is a little a little broader than that. So, for instance, with uh, with the charge density wave in Jellium, it's it's actually still spin restricted. It's a, it's a spin unpolarized system, but it's the density that is allowed to deviate from the the symmetries of the underlying Hamiltonian. But in, in singlet C2, yeah, it's it's just a spin unrestricted calculation. Okay, thank you. And then the more philosophical question. So double hybrids are getting pretty uh, popular right now in the literature. And I guess I wanted to ask, I mean, once we're starting to move toward a correlated wave function, I, like adding that in. So using MP2 or a couple cluster or something like that to, yeah. in addition to the hartree fock exchange, get some contribution to the correlation. Are we kind of straying from DFT there? Like, or do you think that melding of correlation, correlated wave function and DFT is, um, I don't know, it, it all seems very expensive. I don't know if it's better to just do MP2 calculations instead. So what are your thoughts on that? Okay, okay, that's a good question. Uh, I think uh, for 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 molecular calculations, uh, these these double hybrids can be very accurate. I think they can be useful. Uh, and there, uh, I think they 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 stray from the path the exact functional in 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 two ways. That's not necessarily <laughs> necessarily a criticism of them. But but in one way, I think most of them are uh, most of them are, are 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 empirically fitted to molecules, so they're in, it's an interpolative approach. That's not necessarily bad if you're only interested in, in molecules and particular molecules that are like the ones you're you, you're fitting to. But but the other way, which is a little more concerning to me, is that the uh, uh, the typical double hybrid functionals. Uh, work well for can work well for many atoms and molecules but if you apply them to solids and particularly to metals there's a kind of catastrophe there's a divergence because because mp2 diverges for uh for metal it gives you a, a correlation energy that's minus infinity so so Maybe that maybe what they're doing is, is is that these functionals are straying from the universality of the exact functional to give a functional that is accurate for a more restricted class of densities. I would say. Okay, thanks. And I guess that would be true for a, a single hybrid too um, for metals. But anyway, thank you for your answer. That's great. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. This the single hybrid where if you just hybridize with respect to exact exchange. You don't get a you don't get a, 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 a divergence, but you certainly see that you worsen the properties of metals. I told you that scan is actually not as good as PBE for metals. If you do hybrid single hybrid functionals for metals, you do much worse than scan. In fact, <clears throat> the magnetic moments are too big, and uh, and, thing, and the energies are not quite right. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Uh, maybe now I can ask a few more questions before we wrap it up for today. So one sure. question comes from uh, the chat from um, the electrochemistry group, and they, I guess maybe I can also extend it a little bit when I, I know what you answer. So the question is, can you repeat, please, what would be needed in scan to get the metallic properties better? Uh, yes. Uh, what... Uh... What is needed, in, in fact, we've already done this, and we have a paper on it in Physical Review Materials. Uh, the first author is Aaron Kaplan. Uh, and uh, what we do is we replace the kinetic energy density ingredient, which is a fully non-local functional of the density, because it depends on the orbitals, right? Kinetic energy density depends on orbitals. Orbitals are fully non-local functionals of the density. Uh, and if we replace that ingredient by a, a more local ingredient, which is the Laplacian of the local density, del squared of the, of the, of the density, then we can get a, a functional, a, a meta GGA, a Laplacian level meta GGA that's actually very accurate for metals and is more accurate than PBE, probably more accurate than PBE and PBE sol. So, uh, yeah, so, so what we need to do is to use more. Uh, to, to get to make scan more accurate for metals, we have to make it less non-local <laughs> by using mm -hmm. less non-local ingredients. Right. Okay. Um, but then, say in an electrochemical system, we often, for example, we use platinum and we use protons in a solution. So for uh, hydrogen bonds, um, how does this approach? work. So I, I know that hydrogen bonds are difficult with the DFT uh, exchange correlation functionals. Um, it's just more, um, I guess, just less accurate. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but then when it comes to scan meta GGA, is it on like, you, you can get a pretty good accuracy, then you can combine it with the metal surface in the same system? Well, uh, okay. Yeah, so there are two questions there uh, that are related, I think. If you look at hydrogen bonds in purely molecular systems, like uh, water clusters or liquid water, or even the hydrogen bonds in some ferroelectric materials, scan is very good. Scan is very good for those hydrogen bonds. Mm. Uh, but, but you also asked about mo molecules that are bound to metal surfaces. And I think that's a more difficult problem because because you have two, two different kinds of systems <laughs> exactly. together. Uh, and so the functional like scan that are going to be very good for molecules and insulators uh, for systems that have gaps may not be quite good enough for metals. Uh, what, I think, what I think has to be done in the long term and what has not been done yet is to find a way to interpolate you find a, some kind of descriptor of metallicity. And when that descriptor is one, you use a, a very local meta GGA, like a Laplacian level, uh, a Laplacian level meta GGA. And when that, that descriptor is closer to zero and, and the system is less metallic, you use scan or something like that. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think that's a very hard problem. <laughs> And there, there are char uh, it's hard to get the charge transfers right in, in, in a problem like that. So in, in other words, the adsorption energies are more accurate on, say, oxide materials rather than on metals. I think, that, I think that's correct. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think um, that's, that's very likely to be true. Okay, I want to also ask you a question about superconductivity. So you mentioned something that I've been wondering for a long time. So you said that um, the, the superconductivity, the energy scale is very small. So you, you, you have to go to really fine scale in energy. That's right. Um, That's right. But do you see any um, possibility for the future of the DFT to reach that level of accuracy when we can really Get, I guess it's a milli electron volt, right? It's on the phonon level. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it's, 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 it's at that level. So our, our, our standard functionals are just not accurate enough to describe that. Uh, but, but there has been a lot of progress uh, in, in recent years. Uh, and a lot of it was made by Hardy Gross. Uh, 
So, so Hardy has developed the density functional theory for super con, con, superconductors. And the way he does it is to uh, introduce another density. So, so in addition to the total electron density, he also introduces the, the, de the density of the superconducting electrons, which is, of course, a much lower density. But he, 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 deal he introduces it explicitly into the functional. And he's now able to calculate uh, transition, uh, superconducting transition temperatures. I think, uh, I, I think it's, it's not, for, not necessarily for the high temperature superconductors, but for the, the normal superconductors that, that, that follow the BCS theory and um, uh, are known to, known to be just, uh, uh, you know, uh, BCS type uh, superconductors. He, he can make a very accurate prediction of the transition temperatures without any uh, experimental input. Which so, so it is a density functional theory, but it's a density functional theory with an additional density. Interesting. And, and then it's possible to capture the uh, superconductive gap. Yes. The yeah. Gap. Okay. Interesting. <clears throat> okay. Then the final question is, it's partly related to what we discussed uh, with uh, Julia Galle a while ago, a little while ago. Um, it's about the, um, cor well, correlation, kind of comparison between the experiment and theory. So you, you showed a lot of numbers which are related to the accuracies of different methods and functionals. So the one question is, what is your view on how we should really assess the accuracy? What means an accuracy of, of a DFT with respect to sort of what, what is the standard then? Um, and then the second one will be related that's, to experiments. That's a good question. And, and right now, I think this, the, the standards that are used are, are different in chemistry and physics. I think the chemists have better benchmark standards because they can use the correlated wave function results. You know, uh, you, you can do a CI calculation at, at, at the very highest level, or you can do a couple cluster calculation. And often you can get a very accurate uh, benchmark energy, energy difference uh, for molecules to test the functionals against. In the solid state physics, our benchmark is still experiment. And oh. experiment results are are good but they they always have limited accuracy you know it's inevitable that you're going to get limited accuracy so so i think the benchmarks that we have from experiment and condensed matter physics are probably not as precise as the ones from wave function theory I and maybe see. here we'd be able to get benchmarks for for solids from from say couple cluster or something like that uh-huh uh, okay but how do you see the the right way to compare uh, these calculations to experiments in, I mean, in solids. So one thing that we discussed was the, um, through spectroscopy. So you can do that simulation of, of spectra, compare them, but then you also add on top of, of DFT a quite a number of other approximations and, and possibly oh. errors. And yes. so what is your, I'm just curious, this is sort of the last question, but what is your opinion about how we <laughs> should do it? What is the best way ideal and what we might do in the future to improve it. Yeah, <clears throat> so so I would say that the, uh, for, for, for the reasons that you, you just mentioned, I would say that the, 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 the best tests that we currently have are, are tests on ground state properties and ground, ground state energy differences uh, because they can be calculated, in, in many cases they can be calculated or measured very, very accurately. Uh, spectroscopy has a lot of information in it that it, it would be nice to take advantage of. Um, and I, I have a feeling that there, that there are some possibilities for making better uh, excited states. And, you know, so in cohen sham theory, since you, you're doing, uh, uh, you, since you're, you're, you're solving for orbitals, it, it, you can, you can, you can in, at least uh, calculate uh, uh, excited states that correspond to quasi-particle excitation. Yeah. And uh, um, it, there's no theorem that says they would be exact if you had the exact functional, but often they, they still have some meaning. Uh, and I think that's gonna be even more true if we are able to include a self-interaction correction so that the excited states can see a self-interaction corrected potential. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so 
I have I have some hopes that that we can get better better excited state energies at least from delta SCF calculations from calculating differences of total energies uh, from cone sham calculations uh, when they are self interaction corrected and the reason for that is that this Purdue Unger self interaction correction has a lot of problems but. It's it's exact not only for one electron in the ground state, but it's it's exact for one electron in its excited states as well. So, putting in exactness for the one electron density, I think, can only improve the excited states and density functional theory. How much it will improve them, I, I don't know. Hmm. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and how do you see? So, it from this side, I mean, I, I'm an experimentalist. So, from my side, it looks like there's a um, huge pursuit sort of for the improved accuracy in in the theory community. But uh, it should end at some point. How, how do you see where it, it can end? So at which point we'll say, okay, now we're accurate enough. We know the recipes for all types of calculations we can do. We can relax and move on to other, other fields, other kind of theories or research. Yeah, yeah that's a good question. Uh... So it hasn't ended in the 50 years that, that I've been working on density functional theory. <laughs> and I would kind of be sad to see it end because, I, <clears throat> but, I, but at some point, I guess you, you do achieve the, uh, an accuracy level that's good enough. And it's good enough to, uh, to match the, uh, the experimental results and the applications that you want to do. And Beyond that, uh, further refinements may be possible, but maybe they're not so important and interesting anymore. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully it will not end soon. Hopefully we will have plenty of work to do. Maybe, maybe not in my maybe not in my lifetime. <laughs> oh, nobody knows. Thank you, thank you so much, John, for all your um, time and all, all the questions that you answered. And we were thankful for the audience to be still here. We have plenty of people still on YouTube. So it's been a very important talk. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andrew. I enjoyed giving it. I want to thank everybody for your questions and interest. Thank you. Have a nice day, John. <laughs>